They said, everything is silent, the government is silent, the newspaper is silent, and you are turning silent. And I said, yes. There, I so in front of less than 100 people, I made a very short speech in front of the parliament building about the importance of silence. It was a short speech, less than a minute. I was very close to the parliament building. And then I lit 17 candles. Every time I lit a candle, I said a year. I said 1991. Then it was on and on. For 17 years, people began to understand what I was meaning. This was simply a happening. This was to lit a candle for every year the independent party had ruled Iceland continuously. They were mostly to blame. That's the way you saw it in the beginning. But of course, they were not the only ones. Most politicians were. But after the, after, right after the speech, a policeman came out of the door, out of the house, came to me and said, look, you have to move yourself away from the house over to the other side of the street. And I said, why? Because you're distracting the people inside. There's a meeting there. I said to him, uh, you mean through those thick walls of the house? Can they hear my little voice? And he said, yes. Oh, really? I think you've given me probably the best Christmas gift ever. And he said, what do you mean? Well, I'm not going to tell you, but it's an idea. You cannot touch it with your hand. You cannot see it with your eyes. But please go back inside and tell the people inside that I will move myself half the way because I listen to people. And if you don't like it, you will have to arrest me. And I don't think people are, will be very happy with that. He went inside. But the idea that I got was to ask people to meet up in January the 20th when all the parliament members came back from their holidays. I kept saying at the meetings to people, wait, we are going to do something nice and something interesting. And everybody was like, what do you mean? And I said, well, I'll tell you later. And I was creating a kind of a tension. The national theater, uh, national television, finally accepted to take me in and, and give me a, a little space. I got less than five minutes there. And they told, uh, that this was on January 13. They said, so, protesting, it doesn't help, does it? And I replied, yes, it does. Just you wait and see. So far, we have been practicing. And she said, what do you mean? I said, you will find out. <laughs> I had a, what we did also, we wrote the, the minister's letter. And we asked for meetings with them. Reminding them that they were working for us, the people. We wanted to clarify, make them aware of what was going on. I had a meeting with the Prime Minister of Iceland on 17th, of, on 15th of January. I tried to tell him what was happening and he was looking at the clock all the time, like very politely, yes. Uh, he wasn't listening. So I said, look, very serious things are going to happen in this country if you don't react. Really? He said, ah, oh, okay. He didn't understand a word. But on January the 20th, 
people, I told them on the 17th, I told them on Tuesday at 1 o'clock, we will meet and surround the parliament building when the parliament members come back from their holiday. Let's meet up there with our pots and pans, good humor, sing, bang our pots, and make them hear us, because I know they will hear us this time. I was expecting a few hundred people, and there were a few hundred people who started banging pots and singing and clapping hands. But the parliament members, what they did, their first job coming from holidays, in the condition, the serious condition of the nation, where everybody was afraid and scared, they spoke about the price of alcohol. <laughs> that was their reaction. And I was very happy because it made people furious. There were thousands of people who rushed down. They just stopped where they were. They heard about it and they came down there. We were thousands surrounding the building. And we were there until midnight. Then everybody went home to sleep and we met up the next day. And the following day, the third day, and the fourth day. But that night, something serious happened. There were policemen in front of the office of the Prime Minister guarding it. There were drunk people coming from the parks. They started tearing up stones from the street and throw at the police. The beautiful thing is because all of us who pro uh, protested and wanted peaceful demonstration, we had something, just something orange to show that we wanted done peacefully. There were pe people with this orange who saw what was happening and had formed a living line in front of the police. They guarded the police. We had seen crying wives of police and, and a, a big pro propaganda against us, the protesters. But this was a clear message to people that we meant what we said. On Friday, the day after, I called in a group we called the Orange Army. They were people who had been trying to minimize all vandalism uh, in the big meetings. And they met up and stood in front of the police around the parliament building. We were protesting that day loudly. We, they, we had been doing bonfires. We had oil barrels to make sounds and so on. And all of a sudden, we saw there was a funeral in a church that is right beside the parliament building. And everything went silent. We walked away. We waited until the funeral was over. And then we came back. This surprised people as well. The following Saturday, it was the biggest protest meeting ever. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of people shouting yes to our demands. Sunday morning, the first minister resigned. He took along with him the uh, authority, the financial authority, supervisory authority. On Monday morning, the government resigned. This was unbelievable. But the board of the National Bank said no. 
we are not going to leave. And then we said, okay, so we'll come for testing in front of your house. And we did, every morning. We were there, 8 o'clock. It took one month to ooze them out. And there was a reason why we wanted the board of the National Bank to resign. The director of the National Bank is a man called David Otson. He had started in 1990 as the chairman of the Net Independent Party. He became the, the mayor of Reykjavik. He was a very ruthless man. People were afraid of him. He became the Prime Minister of Iceland. And when he had been there for a long time, when he got tired of that, he decided to become the director of our National Bank. Not having any experience or education or anything to be able to do this. He was oozed out of the bank, and to understand the way these people think, he is now, after he was oozed out of the bank, he is the editor of the biggest newspaper in Iceland. <laughs> it tells you a lot. It is owned by the independent party, of course. But. We had elections that year in April. The Independent Party, of course, lost, and we got the Social Democratic and Left Green Party to power. This was also the moment for me when I became we, and I resigned. I said on the last meetings, all right, we have achieved very great things, very something we did not expect. You want new constitution, you want many things, but the most important things we have to do now is to look into our old souls. We have to understand it's not enough to ask for something. We also have to give something. Look into your soul. We have to change our lifestyle, our way of thinking. We have to be honest, almost brutally honest, if we are going to get any changes. I said thank you, and I left. I I just wrote this speech yesterday. <laughs> anyway, the Catholic Revolution brought us many things. And the road to constitutional reform, we got a new constitution written. It has been mapped with many obstacles, mainly from the right-wing independent party. But out of the Cutlery Revolution, many organizations were established both to fight the banks and create pressure on politicians. And in the elections of 2009, four people out of the protesters were elected and went into the parliament. And they promised to inform us what was going on in this house called parliament building. And they have, again and again, they've told us. The situation in Iceland today is that we have almost lost all respect for our parliament. 
We are having elections on 27th of April, and it's going to be a very interesting outcome there. We don't know, of course. But in Iceland today, there's chaos. It's in, in reality, it's been chaos for the past four years. We have been learning more and more about how corrupt our society is. I think it's like five or six years ago, we were told there's no corruption in Iceland, nothing at all. But we have seen something quite different. We have almost been in shock every week, learning how deep the corruption is. Learning how people systematically emptied our banks, stole everything that belonged to the nation. Uh, but because of the awareness and demands of some citizens, the government in Iceland established in March 2009 a financial investigator task force. It was led by the investigator in financial crime Eva Jolie. We had heard of her tireless crusade against corruption in France, taking on, among others, former minister Bernard Tapier and the bank Credit Lyon. In the face of death threats, she carried on the case to uncover several cases of fraud, leading to the conviction of tens of persons involved in the oil business. Eva Jolie was invited to Iceland and she accepted to work for us as a main consultant. According to, Ms. to Mrs. Jolie, we will start seeing results of the investigation in three to four years. And we have been eagerly waiting. We have seen bankers being brought on in for, to, for questioning. And to many people, this is unheard of. It's very unusual. Many of them refused to meet up. But Interpol Act looked for them. They had to come, and they came. We have seen people been brought up, brought into court. We've seen them being sentenced. The first one to be sentenced was a man called Guðlaugsson. He was a former permanent secretary. He was sentenced to two years in prison for insider trading unconditionally. And he has begun his sentence. He currently is serving his sentence in the protection and he attends part-time work at law firm. 